Okay. Looks like that's going. Okay. Um, well, there's some new faces here today. Uh, nice to see you. Um, welcome uh, to another Environmental Data Initiative webinar. For those of you not familiar with EDI, we are an NSF-funded project helping to accelerate the curation and archive of environmental data. We operate and maintain a reliable, registered, and certified trustworthy data repository for ecological research data and provide training on the data archiving process as well as data management best practices. Um, today, our outreach specialist, Suzanne Grossman-Clark, will be providing an introduction to the EDI metadata template. And with that being said, Suzanne, the floor is all yours. Okay, I will share my screen with you. Just a second. I see it. You see it? Okay. Yep. I have to go to presenter view. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yep. Looks yeah. good. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. And as you can see and heard before, the title of today's webinar is Explanation of the EDI Metadata Template. And uh, this is the third webinar in our series on the five phases of data publishing. And before I begin to talk about the template itself in more detail, I uh, would like to give you, during the first part of this webinar, an overview on how this topic fits within uh, the process of publishing data packages in the way EDI understands it, but um, also actually the larger ecological and environmental science community. So on this slide, Colin, oh, I can use a pointer right here. Yeah, so you see the pointer, yeah. So on this slide, um, the five phases of publishing ecological data are listed. And you can find detail on each of those phases on our webpage. The link is given uh, on the bottom of this slide. So if you go to our homepage, environmentaldatainitiative.org, in the menus, you find uh, resources and then five phases of data publishing. And at the moment, this package is, uh, this web page is not static. We are in the process of adding material and sometimes we reorganize the page a little bit with the goal to provide more in-depth information um, and structuring the page more clearly. So don't be surprised if it looks slightly different when you get back to the page after a while. So I briefly go through these uh, five phases of data publishing. In the first phase, um, which is called gather data and metadata, you uh, gather uh, the data um, that you want to, or that you intend to publish together with the metadata as a data package. And this could be data in support of a publication, or it could be continuous observations, or a whole range of um, data that you would like to package and uh, publish as a unit with the metadata. In the second step, uh, the data are formatted, formatted and quality controlled, and they can be in, uh, available as data tables or other formats. This step usually includes structuring your data in a way that is meaningful for archiving, um, and also cleaning the data. The uh, two previous webinars in the series focused on this phase of data publishing. The first one was given by John Porter on creating clean data for archiving, and the second one by myself on how to clean and format data using different tools. And both of those were recorded and are available on our YouTube channel. So, uh, once the data are cleaned, we give attention to the metadata. And this is today's topic. So the, this third step we named create metadata in the ecological metadata language EML. And in short, as probably most of you know, metadata is essential information about how a data set was created and what the data set contains. And archiving this information along with the data is necessary 
in order to make the data understandable later and also thereby reusable. And that is one of EDI's most important goals. And uh, here I take a little detour. So archiving data in a way that makes them reusable is really part of the uh, guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship as they are currently established by the scientific community. And the acronym FAIR stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And that's really the goal when packaging your data for archiving to make them <clears throat> or achieve these um, nouns here that are listed here. And if you um, want to learn more about this in more depth, you can go to the publication that is listed down here by Wilkinson from and many other people from 2016, the Fair Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship and Scientific Data. The journal is uh, published by the Nature uh, Group. So this was a little um, detour or excursion into the larger world of um, scientific data management. But uh, I just wanted to show that it's not EDI coming up with these things, but the whole community is working on a, um, on a way to publish data in a meaningful and uh, way so that they are reusable. So, um, <clears throat> so you see here ecological metadata language or EML. Uh, its acronym. And this is a metadata standard that was developed by the ecological community to communicate essential information about how a data set, set was created and what the data set contains. And I won't talk about this any further today because we will have altogether three webinars on this phase three of the five phases. So first one is today's on the EDI metadata template. And the second one we will host next Tuesday on what is metadata and structured metadata. And my colleagues, Christian Vanderbilt and uh, Margaret O'Brien will talk then um, about structured metadata, <clears throat> how they are used to document, discover, and analyze ecological data sets. And Margaret uh, will talk, this is Christian's topic, and Margaret will talk <laughs> about EML, its structure, and why the ecological community came to develop EML. And then the third webinar in the series will be given by my colleague Colin Smith, and it's on uh, making metadata with the EML assembly line R package. And there we show you how you can uh, create metadata in EML. So once you have the metadata in EML, you submit your data and the metadata to the EDI repository. And there we apply the so-called congruence checker of our repository. And that checker looks for consistency of data and metadata, their completeness and other things to make sure everything is in order when the data package is archived. And the fifth step is then the, um, once the data are archived, we will send you a unique digital object identifier and a URL to your data package. And that way you can cite the data package and your data are discoverable. Okay, so with this I come to today's topic, uh, the metadata template. So, um, this is really a technical talk, and so I will uh, introduce you a little bit to the role that the template plays in the process of publishing for EDI, and then go talk about its content, and later on we can have uh, take questions or discuss the content a little bit. So what is the EDI metadata template? So it's actually a Word document, um, that lists categories of information necessary for publishing data. And you can download it from EDI's GitHub space and I show you how you can do this. Let's see. 
Oops. So if you go to our web page, our homepage here, EDI Environmental Data Initiative.org under resources, you find a link, link to EDI on GitHub. And when you click this, you come to all resources that are available on GitHub uh, from EDI. And on the bottom of the page, you find metadata templates. And when you click on this, uh, you find the link to the actual metadata template, the Word document, and you click on download and there you can download it. And I did this before this presentation. And so I quickly show you what you will find, how it looks like, what it looks like. So it's this Word document and in blue you find the categories uh, for which information is requested. So data set title, uh, shorter name abstract investigators, and so on. And I will go through those and um, will tell you briefly what type of information um, would be important to collect under these titles. Okay, let me go back to the presentation here. Present uh, you, okay. So, um, in short, one can see that the metadata template captures the most important information about a data set. And in that way, it complies with information that is recognized by the metadata standard EML. And I want to see, and you will see that next week, especially in Margaret's talk, the template does not utilize all available elements of the EML scheme, schema explicitly, so you could enter a lot more information and there are ways to do this if that's important to you, but the template captures really the most important information that you need to interpret your data later on. So how do we work with the metadata template? So we provide it for several reasons. Um, the first one is when you request, which you can do, EDI support for uh, publishing a data set, EDI's data managers or information managers will ask you to fill out the template. And they then use it to process the metadata you provided into EML via our um, RSM, EML assembly line. line and with your data, uh, data package is created and published in our repository. Um, <clears throat> the second reason is that even if you are an experienced uh, information manager, you know how to create um, metadata information in EML, then the template gives you a guidance on what type of data you should prepare for processing them into EML. And then a third point is then that sometimes information managers don't have all the information from the data collectors uh, that is necessary to archive a data set. And so they have, a, have a, the opportunity to hand the template to the data collectors, scientists or other people to obtain the relevant information so that the data can be actually published. So now I will talk <clears throat> a little bit more about the actual content of the template. So here are um, the, the types of, is the type of information listed that we are requesting. So that includes the data set title and the short name and abstract, um, a list of investigators and other personnel and their names and roles keywords that make the data set or data package findable, later searchable, uh, the funding of this work, time frame, geographic location, methods for collecting data, uh, data tables and notes and comments. And I will uh, talk now about each of them individually and give you an idea of what this might entail, the information might entail. So data set title and short name, we, for that we recommend the following form, format. So um, you provide 
the project name, the time span, and the location. So uh, we have a kind of a demonstration data set, um, and its title would be Gleon for project name, long-term lake chloride concentrations, the broad descriptions from North America and Europe, the site or the area, and then 1940 to 2016, the time period. And then internally as a short name, which is more like a nickname we use to characterize the data set, it's called gleon chloride. So that's not meaningful very much to anybody reading or wanting to learn more about the data, but it's useful if we refer that way to the data and you might, that might come in handy for you too. Then the abstract is kind of like a scientific abstract, except maybe for the results. So you should cover what, why, when, where data were collected and how they were collected. Under investigators and other personnel, you list their names, roles, email addresses, organizations they work for, and preferably their ORCID IDs. So ORCID ID, it's kind of, you get this ID and then uh, kind of a web page where you exist with all your relevant uh, information for your scientific career. Then you specify the role of a person of those people with respect to this data set, and that could be creator, PI, contact, or others. Uh, in providing keywords for the data set, you would choose words um, that describe your lab, the station, the um, what kind of data were collected. So these keywords are really important to make your data set searchable. And in our case, for the Gleon data set, it could be Cloud Lake Station, just to specify the, the institution, NTL, LTER, or uh, University of Wisconsin Medicine Center for Limnology. You could use a resource that was developed by the by LTER, by the LTER network on uh, vocabulary that you could use to specify keywords and you find it under this link given here at the end, at the bottom of the slide. Um, then you specify funding. This includes the list of grants that provided funding for the data collection. You begin with the main grant and then include the main PI, the title of the project, funding agency and grant number. Um, now we come to the information that specifies the data a little bit more. So time frame, begin and end date of the data collection, if it is ongoing or completed, and the geographic location could be point locations or bounding coordinates if it is an area that you, where you uh, conducted observations or collected data. For methods, and that's really important so that people can um, understand what you did in collecting your data, describe the methods for your data set, including instrument descriptions or point to a protocol online, um, and so on. So maybe even in more detail than you would for a scientific publication. If this data set is a synthesis of other data sets, which it might be, then um, the data sets you use to produce this new one need to be specified, preferably if available by the DOI or URL um, and general citation information. Then for the data tables, um, so column names refers to, and I go back to the template here, because then we can see this better. Column name actually refers to your, what we call sometimes attribute name. Um, I would think in the science community, you would probably say variable name. So you're observable. Uh, then you provide a description of, um, verbal description of that observable. Um, must not be an observable, actually. It could be also, um, your geographic location or things like this. Give a unit or explanation or date format and a missing value code, which is called here empty value code. 
and I go back to the presentation. So the description uh, can be lengthy. It's important that people know what the, um, what the attribute or the variable actually is. And here I included a few more uh, technical specifications we don't know, need to go through, but how you specify units in the template. Um, then uh, in case you use codes in your columns, you need to give an explanation of those. And really important is the date form format. So, um, so really tell us how the date and time is formatted so that people know when, which time zone, if there was daylight, daylight savings time involved or not, so that it's really uh, clear, ident clearly identifiable what time is meant. And then uh, specify missing data either by an E or a number. So it's very important too to know how uh, missing data are specified. And then there's the last point, notes and comments. So here you can include um, things that you think are really necessary for the interpretation of data but didn't really fit in any category. Sometimes you want to include um, publications that are based on this particular data set or other things that come to mind and then we, in processing the metadata into EML, we find a way of, um, of translating them into EML. So, and that actually includes, uh, concludes um, this relatively brief talk on the template. This slide lists a few resources, our YouTube channel, our presence on GitHub, how you can contact EDI's curation team, data curation team. This is probably important, but you also find it on our webpage, info at environmentaldatainitiative.org. And with that, I thank you and open the presentation to questions and discussion. So I go back, exit the screen share. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. Um, yeah, do we have any questions out there? Anybody? about maybe the uh, the metadata template that we use or can be useful for uh, data managers at other sites for obtaining metadata information from data providers at their sites or anything yeah, data management Tim. related? Yeah, this okay. Tim Whitaker at, for the BLELTER. Hey Tim. I had a question about the short name for the data set. Is that used in any kind of user interface or software? Where, where is it used? Why do I care to even supply a short name? Yeah, so the short name right now is being utilized. It, it goes into the EML. Um, I think it is under, yeah, it's it's going into the EML under, I think, a, the data set description. No, actually, no, excuse me, sorry, Tim. Um, now I remember what, how it's being used. It's just being used internally. Uh, EDI uses it um, the way that I use it when translating metadata for a data set from a provider into, um, you know, an EML document. I use that to label the different, uh, um, I think the data table names and some of the um, templates that are associated with this metadata generation tool that we've developed, the EML assembly line. So I use that internally just to kind of keep track of uh, uh, file names that help parse out uh, that information in the assembly line process. So it's, it's just used internally. Is it supposed to be globally unique then? Uh, no. I mean, if no. you're using it for file names. Um, <laughs> So I'm so I'm using it. Okay, so I'm using it. Um, sorry, I, I think I misspoke there. I'm not using it to rename data files. I'm using it to rename the uh, file names that are associated with the assembly line um, templates. And those, if you do have all those template files stored into one large directory, then you're right. They would need to be globally unique. Yeah. Margaret. 
yeah, I just wanted to add to that a little bit. Um, Tim, we, some of the LTER sites use that field as kind of a nickname because scientists often have a nickname for their data set. Um, so it, it's pretty flexible. Um, it doesn't really work to use an, an, a real short nickname for a title for a data set. We really would rather have something larger and more like a paper title for that. But it's handy for someone to say, oh, it's the kelp NPP or some other little goofy name. Um, and a few places that we've used it down the road are for when you need a short name for a particular subcomponent of a data set, like a table or two, and you want to prefix them. Um, and then, yeah, you're right, there may be some need for it to be unique within a certain context, but ideally that's controlled to the context that it has to be unique within, and it's not something that you really have to worry about. Good to know, thanks. Well, this is Tim again, since it's quiet. All right. Uh, I think the instruction that Suzanne gave today was useful in interpreting the template. The template itself does have some of the examples that you showed in your presentation, but your presentation has more. Uh, for example, I, I like the format of the title that you showed, and that's not in the template. I think I'm looking at it right now. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't see that. You are right. Actually, I used some. You're right. I used some of the information in preparing this presentation that Colin uh, provides when using the uh, EML assembly line. You know, in R. So I show you where I got some of this. So I share my screen again. But Tim, you're saying this was useful information that would maybe be uh, worthwhile including in the template itself. Yes, either in the template or you, if you don't want to clutter the template with too much extra text, you could put it in the wiki on the GitHub page. Yeah. For yeah that's... While alerts users, they should check out the wiki or wherever else. If it's a YouTube video, whatever it is, just in the readme file and input, this is where you can find more information about how to fill out this template if you're not going to put it in the template itself. Yeah. yeah. So I can that's quickly a good point. show you where, I, so if you go to our GitHub, spa GitHub space, there's EML assembly line here. You click on this and under documentation instru uh, instructions for operating the EML assembly line. Somewhere buried in here. This I've <laughs> there I found a little bit more detailed information. But you're right, Tim. We should uh, provide this somewhere independently, just as metadata information that's that or explanation of metadata information that's required. So I go back to Let's see. Stop share. Okay. Yeah, I like that idea. I have mm -hmm. a little bit more substance um, than you know the who, what, when, where, why. You know what does that actually mean, and provide a little bit more guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Even it. examples. Uh, the, the way I intend to use it, I intend to use something like the assembly line to make email. But I'm going to hand this to the PIs to fill it out for me. Yeah. 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 So basically, the third point I mentioned in how this can be used. Yeah. yeah and so I, I, think need, that I need lots of hand holding in there then. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that's really good feedback that we rework that a little bit to make it more specific and comprehensive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You want to be able to, I understand where you're coming from, Tim. You want to be able to hand this off to a data provider and, yeah, not have a whole lot of hand holding or ambiguity in what information you're asking for so duly noted and this is this is ian i've got uh two questions for you great one is that uh, it sounds like maybe this eml assembly line has already been discussed or is that coming up in an upcoming seminar because that looks like an interesting tool that i want to know more about so that's so next week's seminar is a little bit more conceptual on uh, metadata and eml by margaret and Kristen, and then two weeks later so three weeks from today, Colin will talk about the EML assembly line. Yeah, That's the 27th. That's the program, and Colin, you can see more about it. Yeah, um, yeah, join us on the 27th for that. Uh, I'll probably just give a high-level overview of that tool. Um, it is something that we, it, it works, it works, it's fairly robust. We, we, we uh, had a group of 
uh, data providers tested out in November and they broke it in every which way possible, which is fantastic because now we have a better understanding of how to deal with all that. Um, and it is in a fairly stable state right now. It's um, still under development, but it goes a long way to um, providing kind of a programmatic uh, workflow to creating metadata, drawing, extracting information out of a, the data themselves, the data table themselves, and also a series of template files that you feed into it. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, we have that, uh, there's kind of a, a good set of instructions and introduction to that on our GitHub space. I'm gonna paste that in the, the chat window right now. I'm pasting, oh. if, you, if you're interested, <laughs> in, there is a, a workshop coming up in Albuquerque, actually, EDI workshop. Um, you could apply, so it's a three-day workshop and EDI pays for travel and meals. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm doing a workshop at the same time. I would I would join you otherwise, but oh, I have okay. teaching. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to mention the opportunity. Yeah, but the, the documentation Colin provided on GitHub is really actually very comprehensive and it guides you through the process if you want to self learn how to use it. Great. Yes. I will definitely be back uh, to learn more about those. I'm very interested in, you know, the tools that can automate the kind of process of extracting the, meta the relevant metadata from the data itself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so this is a little bit different. The assembly line actually uh, converts the metadata into XML or EML, which is a uh, dialect of, yeah, Margaret mm -hmm. of XML, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's some very basic functionality in there that looks at the data tables and and um, extracts information, but it it passes it back to the user for verification. It populates some tables and such, and then um, and then there you know there needs to be kind of a human uh, verification of that. But yeah, that's that we're definitely interested in that as well, Ex extracting metadata information from data entities. But so, what are you thinking of specifically, Ian? The the kind of straightforward stuff about the metadata, not not any of the not any of the methods and things like that. But you know, I have a I have a file that, yeah, you know, because I'm a because I'm a careful data curator, my my data types are in an R data table that is specified as integer and double, and mm -hmm. all those all those things are known. So that kind of information could just be directly extracted from the data into the into the EML for me without me having to, you know, decide whether, oh, do I think that's double or single? Like it's already right. it's already set in the data. So it, it could be auto populated. Yeah, okay. that's pretty much what it does. Uh, we do handle those different uh, numeric types and um, working on one right now, trying to guess the, uh, the daytime format string, but that's kind of, a little ugly. That one yeah, hasn't that's been an important out. one. You could imagine, you know, I have uh, I have a SF table, and it can automatically extract the bounding box and put in the right. geographic coordinates for me. Exactly. So there's a lot of things that could happen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So R um, is a language that you're familiar and, and work with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of what this project is, and um, yeah, take take a look at the the GitHub space, and you know, there's there's plenty of room for contribution. Um, I'm doing some cleanup on it right now, but yeah. So a second question then about um, sort of like what's in the EML template um, and something that I'm just starting to sort of become aware of and, and learn about is the idea of linking your, um, the schema that you use to define your tables to larger sort of out the, getting out onto the, I don't even know what to call it, appropriate semantic dictionary relevant to your domain. So are there ways of, of either encouraging, in, in your template, are there ways of encouraging researchers or somehow sort of coercing researchers into making sure that the things as specific as like the field names that they're using for their data are corresponding to sort of a, a data standard of some kind. Um, we're starting to see more, you know, for geographic data, there's a lot of there's a lot of history of having a data standard so that people are entering the same fields um, using the appropriate labels for things. And I think that's starting to happen in other sciences like hydrology. Um, I have a colleague here at Sink who's working on that kind of stuff where all of the, she's creating a, a, a tool so that as hydrologists are uploading data, the, the columns have the same names across researchers. You know, it's recognized that 
depth, Thalwag depth is always going to be called Thalwag depth. And in the same time, it seems like chlorophyll A should always be called chlorophyll A. And if we could link back to the semantic dictionary, then everybody would be uh, really boosting the findability and interoperability of their data sets. So I'm wondering if that's something that has begun to be thought about within the uh, at EDI. Yeah, I think Margaret can entertain this question fairly well. So. Yes, the short answer is yes, almost. Um, the next version of EML 2.2, which is probably going to be out within a few weeks, um, actually is going to have semantic annotation in some fields um, with ex explicitly, I mean, put in there so that RDF triples can be written from them. Um, if you're interested, there's a couple of issues and discussions you can follow on the NCs. NCs maintains the EML schema so it's in their github repo so if you went to nc's uh what is that word called nc's nc slash eml is their repo there's a, a couple of issues that are specifically talking about how that should look so um i think we're actually at the point of looking for comments from the community so um take a look i can give you the issue number if it's not obvious i think it's just called semantic enhancements so if you were to search on that you'd see it um there's basically three places that we want to put it one is at the at the attribute level the eml attribute so it would be uh, uh where you could actually annotate with a, a measurement from a measurement dictionary um and this the first well there's three places so there's that one then higher up there's a keyword <clears throat> which is another logical place to put something that comes from an external dictionary like uh, any i mean envo lots of scoffs vocabularies would be applicable at the keyword level. And then the other one is simply at the highest level, the data set level, to say like this is a data set about, or this is a data set that is a Darwin Core archive or something like that. Um, but anyway, those are the three levels that we're talking about. Some people say, let's just put it everywhere, um, which is a little terrifying to me, um, although it could actually be the most interesting. Um, anyway, that's the short answer. Awesome. That's really exciting. I'm glad that yeah. I, so I see an issue, semantic metadata module extension. So I'm going to, yes, guess that's, that's it. That's yeah. The one. How would, how would EDI then, you know, you, you, the data repository is <laughs> the data repository. So now you've got data coming in that has, you know, semantic yeah. links. <laughs> it could be really interesting. The, I think the first thing that we'll have to do is to, is look at the dictionaries that are out there and decide which ones we can support right off the bat, because what's going to happen is that someone will say, well, here, I want to annotate my data set against this particular dictionary and what's someone who's constructing EML is going to have to figure out how to do is navigate that vocabulary at some level so that you can understand you're putting an annotation in the right place. So we're going to have to, I mean, we kind of already are looking to see which, which vocabularies can we, um, are, are usable right now for that sort of purpose and how would we support them. Um, and how it fits into the template, uh, that's a, probably there'd have to be a form field or one of the fields would have to say, did you, do you want to link this attribute or this uh, data table column to an external dictionary if so give me the id put it you know put it here but that's the, that's actually what you need is something that's a, a uri to put in a, an annotation field so um there are so there's these two things going on is one is like describing what the model has to be in order for this to be able to happen and then for people who want to use it like eml constructors how do we make that as straightforward as possible you know, how do you give them a pick list of terms to put in a spot? Yeah, great questions. Um, any others out there? All right. Um, I don't know, Suzanne, did you want to uh, give a plug for our um, workshops that are coming up that we have? Uh... Oh, okay. Oh, oh. So um, the workshop I mentioned, and there is a link in the chat window, is um, a workshop on creating EML using R, basically the assembly line and publishing data. And that's during the first week of June in Albuquerque. So June, I believe, 5th or 7th or so. You can find that if you follow the link on our webpage. 
and there will be six spots are taken by uh, our fellowships we are handing out this EDI is um, supporting this summer and those uh, students will participate but then there are six more spots available for people who would like to attend and the week after that also in Albuquerque we have a hackathon maybe Kristen you can talk a little bit more about this sure um, yes we would like to establish an information management um, code repository or actually a registry and so um, the code will live in um, GitHub or someplace else, but we're going to establish using Ontosoft this code registry. And we're inviting people to come that week, the, the week after the, um, the workshop that Suzanne just talked about is second week of June, to bring code snippets or more advanced code. And we can um, work through the process of documenting the code and putting it into Ontosoft. And we'll probably also collaborate to develop some tools either in R or <clears throat> in Python for um, the step in the five steps of publishing your data of actually cleaning the data because a lot of people I think would benefit from having those tools available to them. So it's meant just to be an open source place for information managers to come and get code that will help them with their environmental information management tasks. Yeah, that, that should be a lot of fun. Some useful work going on there. So the link is in the chat window. Hackathon, hackathon on code registry. Our links are rather long. We have to find a link. Yeah. Um, so there is an application process going on for that one right now. Yeah, and the deadline is what is that? The end of March, it looks like. End of March. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fellowships um, or the the making metadata and getting uploading data packages to the repository is I think the 25th of March yeah. that deadline and then the hackathon code registry that applications due on the 31st of March so mm -hmm. yeah so uh, any other questions out there sure I got another question for you okay great uh, so I'm looking at the um, metadata template the word document and its description of uh, data tables and the kind of metadata you might want to get on your data table I'm not I'm not seeing anything about uh, table relationships uh, wouldn't it is it kind of important to have something in here that a formal way of specifying this table or this column refers to a primary key from this table Go yes. Ahead, yeah, and it's actually possible to put that in EML. At least put you can do, you can describe what the relationships are between tables in a couple different ways. But um, it's not it. There isn't a way to enforce it without some external software actually, you know, looking to see if you said it was a foreign key that that you know that it adheres to the rules. Um, for the most part, that <laughs> I'm say this the right way. We are just happy to get data. Um, and, and actually being able to write those complex, more complex or more advanced parts of EML would be great. Um, and there's a few people who are doing it. So if you want to talk to them, I'll put you in touch with them because it's not that difficult to do and there is a place for it. There's a constraint tree in EML and there's also a spot where you can, uh, for um, what would be the controlled vocabulary of one column of data in, in a table, you can point to a, another table. And those two kinds of EML structures are uh, complex enough that we didn't put them in a template that was typically designed for scientists. Although I think they would appreciate it too. I, I, I'll grant you that's fair. I, 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 a lot of data are not going to get the get the table. Yeah, yeah. Although it, it's it's information lost if it's not captured somewhere, and that's the sometimes you'll see tables where you're like, you know, there should be a relationship between these two. It's really obvious that there was one once, and now it can't. It's it's not there. Um, but once we got past kind of the the first hurdle of people actually putting making EML metadata and putting data into repositories, we're at the point where we can start looking at those kinds of more interesting and more complex relationships and how do you actually encode those from, you know, from, from, the, from the scientist, from the originator. 
Um, yeah, I think that would be great. It, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is missing from any any data repository, whether it's Dataverse or um, I'm not, I've never tried uploading anything DDI, so I don't know what you guys do, but there's nothing that lets you say, no, 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 these two data files are intimately connected with each mm -hmm. other. They have well, to be taken together. EDI leaves, leaves that up to the up to the producer. There's a, we have this concept of a data package where it's a group of data tables that go together, but how you define the relationships between them um, is is complex enough that we haven't taken that on as as something we want to um, actually parse the metadata and data to see if you did it as you said you did. We do have a system of checking data sets that come in, which most repositories don't. Mostly they just take it as deposited. Um, but that's one of the things that's a little more complex that um, we haven't addressed yet. Maybe when we get past date times. <laughs> we'll, we'll <laughs> no, nobody will past date time. Don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I guess I shouldn't make that a condition. We'll never get past that. But anyway, those more comp, more interesting structural uh, um, relationships that actually make it data a whole lot more useful would be, um, would be where, and we actually have some uh, examples where we we should be doing that in the metadata. Colin, I'm talking about the Ecocom one, because there's relationships everywhere in there that we should start getting into our template. But anyway, um, that's too long an answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. Though. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Now we're getting geeky. So, do you have oh, a awesome. do you have a list of target date times that you're trying to be able to parse? And if you just throw that list out there, surely there's some hacker in this group of people who pay attention to you guys that can figure that out. In the Python world, there's a Python date util package that parses date times. So if it already parses everything you're after, that's great. If not, where are the deficiencies? I, I imagine it's gotta be something like that for R too. Can I answer that one too? We've yeah. actually been doing this with Java and what happens is most of the date time parsers will throw, will add their own little idiosyncrasies onto it. Um, we're trying, what we were trying to do was adhere date times to ISO. Um, and ISO, the date times, I forget what the number is. But if you look at the, you would, you know, it, at first I thought, well, of course Java supports ISO. No, they don't. They take things like our and turn it into, there's different format strings for different parts of the day, AM, PM. Um, so it, it isn't a slam dunk. It's not as straightforward as we thought it would be. Um, which is kind of where we are right now. There actually is uh, our date time list that, we're, that we would like to be able to detect is in another repository in the EDI um, project called ECC for the, that's the EML congruence checker, where we actually, that's the, the code that actually does the checking between metadata and data. And that's where the date time work falls. And uh, Colin's got it in a branch there. I'm not sure the exact path, but he knows it. Sorry, I blanked out there for a second. Uh, the of uh, the ECC. Yeah, it's in the the date time list that oh, yeah, we want to be able to detect go, would be in that I'll list, right? I'll go look right now. Yeah. Yeah, so John I'm, says none are perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 Lubridate is sort of the one for for R. Yeah. But uh, especially mm -hmm. if you are dealing with anything relating to time zone conversions, it can get incredibly nasty. I've had, I've had people who gave me data that was originally collected in daylight savings time because it was daylight savings time when they put the logger out and then they left it out for a year and they brought it back. And the whole year it's in daylight savings time and all of the date packages if, if they're cognizant at all of time zones, they actually go in and say, oh, well, you were doing daylight savings and now you're not because that's when the time changed. The logger didn't know the time change. It didn't do anything. It, anyway, I've run into, I have, have lost considerable sleep over fighting my way through time zone issues. And there are things like if you're an R user, you should know that the, uh, the right underscore CSV uh, uh, tool in the in the tidyverse will write your dates out any way you want as long as it's in UTC. It automatically takes whatever you got and converts it to UTC. It will not do anything else. Uh, 
anyway, it's there are lots of good useful things in R there well in R and and in these uh, these packages but there's nothing that's really done everything that i can see anyway that's just a personal personal opinion a very passionate one i can tell <laughs> very well, frustrated if, one <laughs> yeah. yeah we deal with that a lot in the water world too with the same situation where you got sensors out there did they use daylight savings time or not what's going on here uh, so if you have a set of date times that you want to test against, like something like unit tests, you know, if you've got just a list of date times you'd like to be able to parse, put them out there. If, yeah, I, I think it'd be fun to play with it. You know, I can try out the Python functionality and see which ones it fails on. Maybe we can find some convergence somehow. It looks like Colin just put it in the chat, yeah, the yeah. Um, list. It's a daytime form mastering. So basically the way we set this up, the, the ECC is the, what we call the congruence checker. It, it looks at certain features of metadata and data uh, for completeness and congruence, meaning do they agree? If you said this was a string field, or if you said it was a number field and there's strings in it, that would mean that is disagreement. Um, so one of the ones we've been tackling recently is, is looking at the date time, the way EML is set up, there's a string a, a text string that defines the content of a field. And, in, and if you um, specify a particular string, did the data in your table actually match that string is what we're trying to ascertain. And you'd think that would be pretty straightforward, but you have to be able to read the dates um, and then com compare the two. And so when I, I think um, somebody asked about why we were using Java, it's just because that's what most of, that's their most, that's their go-to language for the, the coders who work on the repository software. Um, they also write Python, but so I think now they're considering, well, maybe a different library is, has better support for ISO because we thought that if we went with something like ISO, we'd be covered, that there would be lots of libraries that'd be able to handle it, but that's actually not proving to be exactly the case. Um, but anyway, so uh, Colin put the list of um, formats that we thought would be a, a good first stab, first start for support which would be supportable and they're all ISO. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's, that's, in our, that's in our GitHub space. So, you know, issues, you can have conversation there or just, you know. Do you happen to have a version of that list that already has all the numbers, like example dates filled out? Yeah, no, I think we need to, or actually, no, does, does Dwayne have something like that, Mark, Margaret? No, I think he has a data set that has them all in it or something. Yeah, okay. I think he does because he's the when he does his unit tests, he's. He... Yeah, I think so that, you'd like that, yeah. Tim. We could get you that. Yeah. All right, yep. I'll get you. I'll get you that. You did mention previously, though, the idea that some of this is is uh, it's human checked. And so having getting able to catch all edge cases is not really, you know, you could sink all your a lot of, too much yeah. time into that if you're, yeah. if you're relying also on there being a human to just double check it when they write the metadata. Yes, and that actually is probably the safest right now. And and most all of these checks, I mean this particular check, not all of them, but these these sorts of checks are not deal breakers for getting a data set into a repository. What they are is a way to highlight you, something you might have said about the data set that isn't quite the way we you th we think that maybe you might have meant something different, <laughs> so it's more like a way to alert a, a producer. Rather, it's not a way to reject it. The only data sets that get rejected on checks like this are the ones that are structurally unsound. So, that's everything else is a, an alert of some sort. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, then uh, we'll see you. Hope to see you next week. Um, the uh, the title of that talk is going to be "What is metadata and structured metadata?" And then two weeks after that, um, we'll give a I'll give an overview of the assembly line and where it currently stands um, and how to use that tool. So, thanks a lot for. Uh, for joining us today and the invigorating discussion. Lots of great questions. This, this was good. So, ciao for now. See you soon. <laughs>